it's my pleasure to chair the last session. And, uh, and the, the first talk will be by Matthias Kleinman. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also first want to thank the organizers for putting this up. So actually, I think it's also a lot of work to just organize things for this online format. And I'm quite happy how it works out. And um, yeah, I'm also happy to be here opening the last round of speakers. So um, what I will present here is joint work with uh, Chao Yen, Martin Plavala, and Jonathan Steinberg from our group. And yeah, I will talk about a theory independent perspective um, on time and phase space. So maybe I should first explain a little bit what I mean by theory independent. Um, ah, in case you're wondering about, so you see my uh, mouse, I guess. So if you're wondering about um, this picture, this will be the last picture in my talk. Um, so theory independent perspective, we have also heard something just before from Marcin. Um, that's basically a program that has been going on since, yeah, I would say more or less, yeah, at least Marcin's work in uh, 2009 and maybe even earlier. Um, and basically dates back to Bell inequalities um, so, and in this, this uh, well, first a device independent approach. So if you think of a bell inequality, what you're actually doing is you have these two types of devices, Alice and Bob, um, and you consider them completely as black boxes. You, know, you, have, you don't have to know anything about how they work. So it's a theoretician's dream. Um, and the only thing that you need to know is that Alice and Bob are somehow sitting in separate rooms and are hitting the buttons and are writing down on a sheet of paper what are the measurement outcomes. Um, and then later they just meet and compare results and then they make fantastic conclusions from that. Um, so the reason why this works is first um, is because, well, you can write down a theory um, or a framework or actually many different frameworks um, in which you can model this type of experiments, which is not bound to quantum mechanics. So this framework contains quantum mechanics and contains uh, the classical world, but also contains box world and Popescu-Rolich boxes and these almost quantum correlations and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you can write down this experiment um, in, this, in this framework. And then you can analyze it and say, okay, what can I learn about the structure of my theory by just looking at this, this type of experiment? And what you find is that um, you can learn actually a lot of things. For example, you can learn that you have entanglement in some sense between your two parties. If you violate the CHS inequality, say, um, you can learn that these two observables, if you push button one and button, button two, they have to be incompatible. Um, you can learn that there's some kind of indeterminism in a sense of Bell and so on. Um, so this gave these, these theories a boost, I would say, or it's like, at least a good motivation for these frameworks of operational theories. Um, and then people started to, to actually look for um, what is the role of quantum theory in this general framework of operational theories. And then we heard just the previous talk, formation causality or what Julio did, for example, and also uh, Markus Müller is adding a lot of symmetry. And then you see that if you add the, the appropriate axioms, you get quantum correlations or even quantum theory. So that's a very successful thing that has been done and it's a very interesting program, I think, which will also uh, be around for, for quite some while. Um, however, it has its drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is that it's based on a very ma broad mathematical structure, which comes basically from the fact that you're not assuming much. You're just saying, I have this kind of black boxes, I'm hitting the buttons and looking at the light bulbs uh, just lighting up. And um, this is, of course, not so much physics, but maybe even more information theory. Um, so you don't, you, you have limitations in the sense of you don't have any experimental instructions other than hitting the buttons. In particular, if you say you want to have the almost quantum correlations, for example, um, nobody can tell us actually how to build an experiment which has even the remote chance to produce those correlations. Um, we can't just cannot do this. This is, um, this, 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 this framework is so general that it has no connection to physics in the end. Um, so I would say in, well, in, in that kind of sense that these operational theories give us a rather limited insight into the physics of quantum theory. They give us insight into the structure, but not really about well, how to build experiments, I would say. Um, so this is the broad um, perspective of this talk. Uh, and uh, I looked now 
into two things. Uh, first one is the origin of the Schrodinger equation. So that will be about time translation or time shifts. Uh, we heard already about this today uh, two times. And the second one will be, yeah, actually about how to suggest an experiment that is not necessarily following quantum mechanics or classical experiments. Um, okay, so let's go ahead with the first part. Actually, I actually have to check that I get some kind of clock that I don't speak too long. Um, so the first part will be about the origin of the Schrodinger equation. Um, so these two guys, the left hand is uh, Schrodinger, and on the right, this is uh, our PhD student, Jonathan Steinberg, um, who was the main contributor to this uh, research here. And um, so I cannot read actually my, the top of my screen, which is a little bit um, disturbing. Okay, so I want to talk about the origin of the Schrodinger equation. And in principle, this is well understood. Um, the, the main idea is that you realize that the Schrodinger equation actually comes from Stone's theorem once you put the right axioms in place. So how does this work? So we have here the Schrodinger equation. I don't use here Dirac notation for reasons you will maybe understand later. Um, so of course the Schrodinger equation is, is good, good and nice as differential equation, but actually from a mathematical point of view, um, this is not so practical and actually is not sufficient in a certain sense. And you should rather look at the integrated version where you have um, that if you have a state at time zero, then you can compute the state at time t by just applying here e to the minus ht. Um, so we have here on an abstract level a time shift function um, which transports the state from time zero to time t. And this is whatever kind of function transporting states to states or vectors to vectors. And what you now do is you have to impose axioms so that just from saying I have an abstract function mapping the states to states at different times that you get end up here with this particular form which follows from the Schrodinger equation, right? And um, so these axioms, this is actually well established, I would say, um, are the following three. So you first you assume this is a unitary transformation, which basically is motivated by the fact that you want that you preserve the norm of the states. Um, and anyway, if, you, if it's not unitary, you would be in so much trouble that uh, we would have noticed a long time ago. Um, the second property is maybe the key property, namely that this is uh, basically a Markovian system. So if you transport your system to the time t plus s, you can actually compute this by first going to t, writing down your state, and then shifting again with its amount s. And this gives you the transformation t plus s. So it just tells you that the state, the immediate state is sufficient to compute the future. And it does not depend on the initial time. Um, and then you have a third assumption, which is mostly mathematical, st uh, telling that this transformation should be strongly continuous. So continuous is just a smooth, smooth and nice. I think as a physicist, we don't have any problems assuming that. And strongly is just a, a property for infinite dimensional systems, which you need, and it's not a particularly um, weird assumption. So if you have these three axioms, then you're actually in the realm of uh, Stone's theorem. So this applies exactly for uh, transformations of this type. And um, the theorem is a representation theorem and tells you that any such transformation which obeys these three axioms can be written as an exponential uh, of an operator times t, where this operator here is anti Hermitian or uh, skew adjunct. And you see that that's obviously true here. So we did the right thing because this operator with because of the i. This is actually skew adjoint. And so we see that the only thing that we learn from the Schrodinger equation, if we buy these three axioms as being reasonable axioms, then the only thing that the Schrodinger equation adds is the identification of the skew adjoint operator with um, minus A over H bar times the Hamilton or energy. Um, in principle, that seems to, to, to do the job, right? Because what else could be here? Because you have, um, it should be something with the energy or Hamilton operator. Um, for reasons of units, you have to have an H bar here. You have to have the I here to make it skewer joint. This is how you have to map the uh, self joint operator to a skewer joint operator. So you need the I. And the minus sign is just telling you that it's an active transformation. So 
basically we are done, right? Um, this is not completely true because what we what I just did is a reasonable, I would say, a reasonable uh, way to to um, say the, how the Schrodinger equation comes about, but it's not rigorous. Um, so you can ask yourself, do I actually have any means to write something down which is different from just saying that this this generator A, which occurs in Stone's theorem, is just minus I over H bar H. And um, so this question is um, rather old. Um, I think it dates back to, to uh, Schultz somewhere in the 90s. Um, and this is well summarized under the term dynamical correspondence. So dynamic correspondence is a map from your energy observable, which I still label by H, uh, from your energy observable to the generator of time shifts, which is the skewer joint observable, which occurs in stone sphere. And so if you want to read a recent discussion uh, in, in a lot of details, then I can refer to this paper here by Brandford and others um, from 2018. Okay, so this dynamic correspondence um, is now some function and basically we need to characterize this function. And um, we do this again by some kind of axioms and the typical axioms that people impose here are um, two axioms. You see, I put three here because I separate one of the, the axioms into two. The first one is commutativity. So you want that your generator of the time shifts, uh, this psi, uh, phi of h, commutes with your energy observable. Um, the reason why you want this is because if you write now down the time evolution of your Hamilton operator, you want that this is actually invariant. At least you want that expectation values are invariant under time, trans under time, time shifts that are induced by the very Hamilton operator that you're considering. Yeah, so this is some kind of consistency condition that you're really um, doing the right thing. You're really doing something that's actually connected to your Hamilton operator if you do your time shifts here. The um, second and third property, if you combine them, this is just linearity of this map. Um, and I want to separate this into two parts, namely homogeneity, which means that if you multiply by the real number, your Hamiltonian, then the, the time shift operator should be multiplied by the same number. So what this means in the end is if you have a high energy, if you increase the energy of your system, then your time evolution should be faster. Or the other way around, if you're putting this very close to zero, then your time evolution should almost stand still. That's the intuition behind this assumption. Um, the second assumption is additivity. So if you have the sum of two Hamilton operators, which uh, well, it's only interesting if they don't commute, um, then these maps should also just be the sum of the individual maps. Um, so this is in particular important if you think that this is the, the Hamiltonian of your free system and H prime is your interaction Hamiltonian. Um, then if you wouldn't have this kind of, of structure, then for example, you could not do any perturbation theory or could not go for interaction picture and so on. So this is, I would say this more practical constraint. So it's very nice to have it. Um, I'm not sure whether it's actually essential to physics that you have this constraint. Um, at least I'm at the, I, we, we could not find really a, a stringent physical reasoning for that more like, okay, if it's not the case, then yeah, we wouldn't have perturbation theory at least. Okay, so these are the three axioms. Um, and now you can ask, okay, which maps are compatible with these three axioms? And um, surprisingly, this has not been done before. At least we did not find it anywhere in literature, although I think it's not so far-fetched to, to ask this question. And what was even more surprising to us that this is actually pretty hard to prove. Um, so what we found in the end is that, yeah, in principle, this is what you expect. So what you get is that um, this generator of time shifts is something like a, uh, I times the Hamilton, Hamiltonian, and then you have some constant, which of course will be later one over H bar. And you get some additional term, which is a little bit stupid or a little bit redundant, which is just proportional to the identity um, and you have some arbitrary operator here. So it's just some number which you compute from your Hamiltonian and then multiplied by identity. So that's the most general form of such a map um, that you can obtain. Um, now, if you compare this with the Schrodinger equation, then you find that lambda, of course, has to be uh, minus one over h bar. This is a constant of nature. The minus sign, again, is a convention for being a forward transformation or a, a, an active transformation. 
And um, this G in principle, you can choose in any way, but you have to be careful because this G has to be universal. So if you it's not like if you compose systems that you would get a tensor product of these Gs or so, but it must be a universal thing that holds for all the quantum system. And um, if you think about it, what it does in the end, it just adds a global phase to all your free quantum states and therefore just is not detectable. So you can as well just set it to zero. Um, so in the end, we see that using these three these three axioms, um, we get a unique form of this um, dynamic correspondence. And therefore, we have basically finished an axiomatic derivation of the Schrodinger equation, or at least we have pinpointed which kind of assumption you have to put into your um, into your derivation or you need in order to, to end up with the Schrodinger equation as a natural solution. OK. So now writing down axioms is an easy thing if you know what you're aiming for. So we wanted to prove the Schrodinger equation. We had it there before. Um, so obviously we ended up there, right? It's not a surprise. Um, what we then wanted to do is actually test whether our axioms are good. And the idea to test this is to apply to another theory, a theory which is not quantum theory, um, but it has to be very similar to quantum theory because we use pure states, we use unitaries, um, so we, we cannot go to a completely crazy theory. And the one that we picked is one of the sister theories of quantum theory, it's quaternionic quantum mechanics. Um, so that's actually a pretty old um, thing. People have thought about this very early in, in when developing quantum mechanics. So you have complex numbers. Um, so why complex? You could use maybe real, use real numbers as the one possibility. The other one is saying complex numbers is not crazy enough. Let's go to quaternions. Um, and this has been, there's whole books on that, and there has been a lot of literature, a lot of investigations, um, what would happen if you would write down quantum mechanics over the quaternions. Um, so I'm aware that not everybody has worked a lot with quaternions. So I will just very briefly tell you what you basically do in this type of quantum theory. Um, so quaternions are an extension of the complex numbers in that so the complex numbers are somehow a representation of the two-dimensional real vector space, and this is somehow a representation of the four-dimensional real vector space. Um, so you have uh, three complex units here, i, j, and k. Um, they also, if you square, give, give minus one, similar to complex numbers, but they are not commuting. So you have, uh, you have not really a field here, but you have a skew field because they are the, the entries in your field or the elements of your field are not commuting, and you have here this commutation relation. Actually, if you want to think about this as a physicist or quantum information guy, um, the easiest thing is just to think of this here of being the Pauli matrix. So you, here you have the, the zero, uh, sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and then you get exactly the same kind of algebra. It's just that actually when Hamilton invented the quaternions, uh, matrices have not been yet invented. That's why the formulation is a little bit different. Okay, so this is, this is the basic thing that we're working with, so replacing complex numbers with quaternions. And um, what you can do now is you can just formulate quantum mechanics using that. So what you do is you, you define a Hilbert module that's like, like a vector space, but for non-commuting um, of the skew fields. It's, we just consider here the Cartesian product. So to make it easy, you have to make a convention about scalar multiplication. Um, you have to, um, you can convince yourself that you have expectation values as, as you're used to it. The inner product is just what you would also do uh, in complex or what you know from complex quantum mechanics with complex conjugation and so on. You can even make a spectral theorem and compute eigenvalues and projectors. So everything is pretty similar. Um, but what we are of course interested now in is, uh, can you write on a Schrodinger equation here? What is about dynamics? And um, the first thing that you do is, uh, so basically have two steps. We first have to consider the time shifts and these axioms and just translate it. Um, and this was done already uh, very early by Finkelstein, who is one of the, the people who worked a lot on quaternion quantum theory. And you find that the theorem is the same. It's the same as Solm Stone's theorem. You find that the representation of these time shifts is just uh, the exponential function here uh, with a skewer chunk operator. Um, it gets more interesting now if you go to the dynamical correspondence, because now it gets a little bit more. Uh, it gets well, less clear what you have to do. The reason is that your, your complex units are not commuting um, with the Hamilton operator. So you don't know whether you should write minus I over H bar or should write it on the left or the right, or maybe use J or use whatever. 
So suddenly you have a lot of choices to actually construct SQ emission operator. Um, so now our axioms maybe will be handy because maybe our axioms will tell us what is the correct way to do that. Um, so we looked into this and um, you can just explicitly construct the possible, the possible um, dynamic correspondences. And we find that first in dimension one and two, there's actually a, a formula which is for both dimensions the same. Um, it's basically you multiply your Hamilton operator from the left and from the right by some skewer giant operator, and then you subtract on some correction term. So it already looks a little bit strange, um, but okay, this is just what turns out and it's more or less, I mean, the only thing you have to fix is the skewer giant operator. However, the problem is that this only works in dimension one and two, so somehow for quaternionic cub qubits, and okay, dimension one is maybe not so interesting. And if you go to higher dimensions, then we can actually show that no, you cannot find any uh, dynamic correspondence except for the trivial one, which just map maps everything to zero. So quaternionic quantum theory does not seem to have a Schrodinger equation except in dimension uh, one and two. Um, I also have here an example, but maybe because I'm already a little bit slow, um, this is not so important. Uh, just can write down something like a Schrodinger equation. Um, okay, so what do we learn from this? So we had um, our axioms and what we learned is that quaternionic quantum theory is not working. We don't get a Schrodinger equation. Of course, you might say, okay, it's quaternionic quantum theory, so it's wrong, forget about it. Um, but somehow I find it surprising that's not possible. And I'm wondering whether we did something wrong. Um, and you cannot go through this list of axioms. And, and so the one that I picked already before is that additivity is maybe a very strong assumption and maybe one should drop this. Um, and in fact, if you drop this, you can maybe write down something, um, some dynamical correspondence. Um, but um, okay, there are two other assumptions which you can make or which, which are done. Um, but if you drop additivity, if just to, to somehow save quaternionic quantum mechanics, then you would also have to do this work for normal quantum mechanics. And actually we don't know what is the result there. So we don't know whether there's would be any kind of new type of Schrodinger equations emerging if we drop additivity in quantum mechanics. Um, so somehow the, we are not yet sure that we had actually found the proper axioms for the Schrodinger equation and we don't know whether it, it can be done that easily as we just did it. Okay, that concludes um, the first part here. And um, I would now go, now go to the second part, um, which is, uh, a little bit different, but it's also somehow connected. We will also have dynamics and uh, yeah, it will be the same type of questions. How can we go for um, an operational or how can we talk about more about physics uh, without talking about quantum theory itself? Um, so the two people that are on this slide here is Herman Weil who contributed um, to this uh, in more or less setting the stage by just introducing a quantization procedure, which I think nowadays is more or less accepted to be the correct one and um, there has been a lot of discussion in between but nowadays I think most people agree this is the correct quantization method and the guy on the right is Martin Clavala who is a postdoc in our group and um, worked on this topic here. Um, so what is this about? So quantization is something either you hate it or you love it say um, so the problem is that uh, you have a situation like this here so you have some kind of lab and what you want to do is you want to um, find mathematical formulas to describe what is going on there. Either this way or the other way, you have mathematical formulas and want to go to this, but this is not going to be interested in a moment here. Um, now you can be, have the perspective and say, okay, I don't care because I know my quantum mechanics and I can just immediately, if I see this table, I know, I know my Hamiltonian, it's no problem for me. Um, I'm not sure it's really how this works in practice. So for sure, there are certain things here on this table, namely polarization or so, where you just have to write down a finite dimension of quantum uh, description. So you're, you're immediately into quantum mechanics. But other things like, okay, if you actually measure that polarization, how you do this, you do it on a polarizing beam splitter and then you split it into two paths and then you measure the path of your, of your photon. Um, so in the end, you're, you still have this kind of phase space observables um, being around. Um, 
And the question is, how would you possibly describe any phase space observable in quantum mechanics? And I would argue that if you want to model a system, you'd, you'd never start by writing down a quantum mechanical system. You just, at least if it's about, about uh, something that has a phase space representation, you start by having some classical intuition and then you apply some heuristic quantization scheme and then you end up with your quantum model. And the, like the key question I want to ask here, um, so this is the, the Hamilton operator if I didn't do it wrong for, for, for the harmonic oscillator. And so why is that the case? So why, why is this actually, or in which sense is this the proper description of a harmonic oscillator? That's the, in my view, the, the question that's behind quantization. And quantization does maybe not tell you why, but at least it tells you how. So how you end up in this expression starting from classical intuition. Okay, so to be a little bit more formal, a quantization procedure is any map that maps a phase space function, which I just labeled here by A, which should be maybe some observable in a, in a broad sense, to a quantum observable or to a mission operator. And this is you now the question is how is this procedure? And I think everybody has seen this. Of course, what you do is you first construct observables Q and P for position and, uh, and momentum, such that the commutator is some other canonical commutation relation. And then you write down your phase space observable, you replace uh, Q by Q hat and P by P hat. And if this is, turns out to be not self-adjoint, you just symmetrize. That's more or less the rule. That's what everybody does. And this is basically what works. And I think there's not really, I mean, there, I think there are artificial counter examples of this, but, this, but I think in practice, this is just what you do. The problem is that this is not what we can work with because this is mathematically ill-defined. So if you look at the, the mathematical details, you will find that this is just, it's not working this way. And this is more or less what Weil and, and von Neumann have been working out, how to do it properly. I don't want to go into details, um, but in principle, what you do is um, you do something very similar to the, what it presented in the first part. You start with some kind of one parameters groups, which are now representing not time shifts, but translations in, in momentum or in, in, in uh, position. And you require that they have this particular uh, commutation relation, then you again invoke Stone's theorem, and then you see that if you find a representation of these unitaries here, then uh, because these are very similar to that, also Stone, Stone's theorem applies, you can extract actually the position and momentum operator from here. So this is summarized in the Stone von Neumann theorem. So this is how you properly obtain position and momentum. And once you have the operators for position and momentum and you have an arbitrary phase space observable, then while quantization tells you that you have to compute this ugly integral here, note that here you have the position and momentum observables in there. And then you obtain an observable in Hilbert space or which is uh, appropriate and gives you the right quantum mechanics. That's how you do it. Um, so that's nice and tells us that quantization is to some level understood. The problem is that I, I don't see any way to apply this to, to, to any other theory in quantum mechanics. This is, this is so strongly tied to quantum mechanics that I don't have any means of, of even talking about another, another theory here. Um, so our approach here was, okay, let's abandon this here and let's just use a different approach and just never go to the operator space and just stay in phase space all the time. That's our basic idea. Um, so what we use here is uh, the well-known formulas of, of Wigner functions. Um, so, well, I think you have seen Wigner functions, but uh, in case you haven't, this is, this is how they look like. So this is a representation of density operators in phase space. Uh, so it's a faithful representation, or this is an injective map from, from operators to, to the phase space functions. Um, which is linear. And the point is that these phase space functions are actually real valued. They're not necessarily positive, so they are not a probability distribution over phase space, but at least um, they give you some real representation. Okay, um, the particular useful property of this representation is that if you take the marginals with respect to P or Q, so this is what this plot helps you to understand, um, then you get actually a probability distribution over Q or P. So this is what is written here in formulas. So the probability that, so I'm now here very, very uh, Catholic in writing Q tilde, denoting the random variable for your position operator. Um, and then you have to, to write this marginal and maybe yeah, look at a small interval because you cannot 
say the probability at one point, but okay. But in principle, what you just obtain from taking the marginal here is, um, is, that, is indeed the probability distribution for position and momentum if you take either of these marginals. So these are two examples that you see here, and I took this here, just stole these figures from uh, Nagier. Okay, so this is a well-known formalism, um, and this can be even extended. So this is just about the the the, uh, the, uh, the states, and we can now extend this to operators uh, by basically just applying the same transformations to operators. Uh, this is sometimes called the wild transform. It differs in a factor of h bar more or less. Um, and the useful thing about this is, if you if you, if you do this, if you compute this. Um, what you, uh, so if you compute the Y transform of your operator and you have the Wigner function of your state, then you can obtain expectation values um, of, your, um, of your quantum observable by just uh, in taking more or less the inner product between these two. So just taking the, the product here and integrate over, over the phase space. And I write this here just with this inner product formula. So that's a very useful formula because it makes computation very easy, at least on a formal level once you have this phase space function. So what this tells you is, in the end, I don't need to work in Hilbert space. I don't need to work with, with operators in principle, or at least in a formal level, I can work also just using phase space functions, namely these while and weaker transforms. And this is enough at least to get the expectation values um, for arbitrary observables. Um, I also want to give you one example of such a while transform. And um, the easiest one is take the harmonic oscillator. So we start with the harmonic oscillator now with p hat and q hat. Take the while transform, and if you compute this, you find out actually what you get back is the phase space function of the classical harmonic oscillator. Um, this is not a coincidence. Um, you can actually show that as long as your Hamilton operator is a decent function of, of your position and momentum uh, operators, that then the wild transform is basically the same fu uh, function, at least if it's a low order polynomial. Otherwise, you get here some correction terms, which are maybe of the order of h bar or something. Um, it even goes further. So if you have your wild transform uh, of, of your operator, you can even calculate the time evolution. Namely, what you just have to do is you just apply the Liouville equation. So the time evolution of your Wigner function is actually given at least up the zero or an h bar in um, by using the Liouville equation for your your weil uh, observable and uh, the Wigner function. So that's that's very useful because now basically we can just apply classical physics to our phase space functions. The problem here is that one thing that we can't do is we can't really get access to the probability distributions of your observables. We can calculate expectation values, but as soon as we go to higher moments. Um, these, these correction factors of h bar of or h bar actually kick in, and we wouldn't see any quantum effects, of course, if we just use this, this, these functions here. So we cannot, we don't have access to higher moments of the probability distributions. So that's something that some that, that this is a grain of salt that makes it somehow difficult. So in principle, you have to compute a Wigner function for, for any moment of your of your uh, of your observable of your quantum observable. And this is now. Um, where we started to think how we can can we fix this problem and um, we are asking now how can we actually get this the, the, the distribution of any observable um, or how we can can we get access to that um, for this we just look how do we do this in quantum mechanics i mean this is again um, of course obvious and, and well known so what you write down for your observable you write down the spectral decomposition now we do this here using a projective measure um, so we use this notation of the spectral measures here to get the spectral decomposition of our, our quantum observable. And what we can now do is we can compute the probability distribution of the outcomes of our quantum observable. And this is just given by, well, the normal Born rule here, um, where just for formal levels, I mean, you have to introduce this integral here, but it doesn't really change the meaning. Um, so this is how we do it in in Hilbert space, and now we just take the same construction uh, in phase space. So we construct a phase space measure here, which is um, simply the, the wild transform of our projective measure. This is what, what is defined here. 
And if we suppose that we have computed this, this function here or this measure here, then we can easily compute the, the distribution of any observable by just um, taking here this inner product in phase space with our Wigner function and with this phase space measure. So that's the main trick to, um, to actually get rid of the problem that, that the Wigner while formula does not get, give us access to probability distributions. Okay. So if you now go one step back, so what, what did I just talk about and what can we, uh, what is it good for? So what we have achieved or what, what we see here in this Wigner weil formalism, uh, where we in addition have this phase-based measure, what we get is uh, states are now phase-based functions, which are real valued, um, uh, not necessarily probability distributions, but you know, correct marginals maybe. Um, and observables are now this uh, phase space measures that I just introduced in a previous slide. Uh, so these are also real valued, um, real valued measure. So the, for any Q and P, this is a real valued, uh, it, gives, it gives you a real value. And uh, these two guys, um, yeah, describe more or less your, your theory because you have states and observables. Um, the, the probabilities are just given by a scalar product. And if you now, look what is the mathematical structure behind this, you find this is exactly one of these operational theories. You just end up with a generalized probabilistic theory, um, but with the benefit that now we have Q and P here, so we have uh, a phase space introduced into our generalized probabilistic theory. And the fact that, that these are really position and momentum comes to the fact that the marginals of this Wigner function here is actually, um, just giving you really the distribution of position and momentum. So this is a little bit of a complicated way of writing this, but this is actually what it says. Okay, so we have now a generalized probabilistic theory, or we have now seen that this, this wigner weil formalism of quantum mechanics actually can be seen as a specific instance of a generalized probabilistic theory. And um, now we can just look into how actually this looks like and whether we can use this to actually write down a theory, which is maybe really a generalization. So it's not quantum theory and it's not classical theory. So what I now will give you is three examples is first quantum theory, then classical theory, and then something which is neither. So first the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. Um, I already told you how the wild transform uh, looks like of this. Um, of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this system. And it's just a classical harmonic oscillator. And what we can now do is just the Wigner transform of the, uh, of the eigenstates. And this is well known. And I think it's in every quantum optics book. Um, so the, the ground state is some kind of Gaussian shape. And then you get this Lagarde polynomials here. Um, this, this, so what, okay, what do I plot here? So in this direction is the, the radial component of your phase space observable. So we go into some kind of, um, into some kind of spherical coordinates. Okay, so this is well known and well established. Um, now the question is, what is this phase space measure that we introduced? Now this has to be just the sum over um, these eigenstates. Um, and what you can now look into is, uh, for example, how does this, this measure look like if you say sum from the first 50 eigenstates? So this is like the projector of all energy eigenstates up to energy 50. And you see that this works out quite nicely. So basically this gives you a one and it should, should be basically a one in a good approximation, it gives you a one, or if it's some here, the, um, your projector and you weight it with the energy, then you should end up with your Hamilton operator should, so should be basically R squared, which also works if you do this here for low order. And you can also prove that actually this converges to the, to the true Hamiltonian if you put the right norm here. Okay, so this is quantum mechanics. Um, we can also look for classical mechanics. Um, so this puzzled us for a while, actually, how does it look in classical mechanics until we realized that this is something that we all know. Um, in classical mechanics, this phase space measure is just an indicator function. So it just tells you uh, it's one if your energy is in the interval you're looking for and it's zero elsewise. And um, the eigenstates, um, well, what is an eigenstate in cl classical mechanics actually? That's, that's the, maybe the, the main question or this is the thing one has to, to think about it, but actually something well known. 
So we want at least two things of an eigenstate. It should have sharp energy, right? So the distribution of the energy should be uh, should be a delta function. Um, and the second thing that we want is that it's constant in time. So it does not change in our time evolution. And these two things are actually exactly what defines a microcanonical state in statistical physics. So the eigenstates in, in classical theory um, are the microcanonical states. So in particular, they're not pure states, but are some kind of mixed states. Okay, so this is classical and quantum mechanics. And usually if you have a theory uh, where you can, in the same framework, describe classical and quantum mechanics, you can also describe any kind of other theory. Um, and this is now what we do, I want to do here in this last example. That is um, just an example of something that is neither classical and quantum. So just what are the features, we call this a toy oscillator because it's not really, I mean, it's, we don't know whether there's any physical system which can realize this. It would be, I mean, because it's neither quantum mechanics nor classical mechanics, I suppose you can't. But in principle, uh, yeah, we write down an oscillator uh, which has the following properties. So the phase space measure is positive. Now in quantum mechanics, this is not positive because yeah, quantum, usually it's seen as a sign of, of quantum mechanics if your, your while functions are having negative contributions. So this is not the case. It's actually, it's positive. So it looks like a classical theory. However, it has discrete spectrum. And this discrete spectrum is not by choice, but we are more or less forced to actually put here a discrete spectrum. So this looks again a little bit like quantum mechanics. The ground state energy is zero. This is something that we put in by hand. We can, we can just construct it in such a way that the ground state energy is zero, which of course it contradicts quantum mechanics because somehow uh, position and momentum are not commuting. So ground state should not be zero, but in this theory you can have a ground state energy of zero. And the eigenstates are not positive everywhere. So meaning that you have some negative contributions, which again is a sign of quantumness, at least it cannot be a classical situation. So somehow this oscillator is in the middle between classical or quantum, or at least it's neither of these two. And this is now the last slide here is just um, pictures how this would look like. I don't want to explain this too much into detail. Um, so the phase space measure, um, what it does is gives you just Wigner function, uh, while, while functions if you evaluate it uh, for the eigenfunctions, uh, for the eigenenergies. And then what you get here is, is this kind of shape. So each of them is for different energy, how this while function looks like. And if you wonder what is the shape here, this is just actually a sawtooth structure if you square it. And also the energy spacing here is not by free choice, but this actually somehow comes out of the formulas. Um, then, okay, if we assume that this is our energy observable, it has a structure, we can ask what is an eigenstate. And the first interesting eigenstate occurs for energy level two. Um, and then we can have here um, this, this uh, eigenstate. So it has here some positive distribution and some negative contribu distribu contribution, which makes it non-classical. Um, but the marginal um, of this distribution. So if you now look for the probability distribution for position or momentum, you get something that you is quite common for quantum for for any kind of harmonic oscillator. You get this kind of peak on the on the on the border, and then something which is rather flat in the middle. So this looks like higher excited states of quantum oscillator of, of any quantum or classical mechanical oscillator typically look like basically. Okay, so that's, I think I'm done with my time because there should be, I think, five minutes for questions. Um, so I just put here the last slide, to just remind you in the first part, I was speaking about time evolution and how to have axioms on the reading equation. And in the second uh, part, I was talking about how one can actually construct a phase space theory for, um, or can construct a phase space for theories which are not quantum theory. Okay, thank you for your attention. Um, th thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. And so I, I think um, a measure of how interesting it was, was that I didn't fall asleep, although it's the end of the conference. So, and- uh, That's because you turned off your video. Uh, <laughs> but well, you, you can trust me on this. I, I, I have a tie, I'm not lying. So, 
Um, the, the first question is from Yarek. Um, do you have the Schrodinger equation in your formalism? I assume, Yarek, you mean uh, in the last, uh, in uh, this last uh, thing that Matthias was talking about. So yes, yes, in, yes. I mean, I mean this formulation. I'm sorry if I missed it, but somehow, uh, well, that's the this, question. You mean in this phase space formulation? I mean, in your formulation where you use this uh, vialized uh, yes, spectral yes, projectors. Yes. Um, yeah, so for the time evolution, so the answer is, well, I don't know, uh, in the sense of we use it. So what, what, what we use is that the time evolution for the harmonic oscillator should be given by the Liouville equation. So this is what I wrote there. This is an assumption that we made. So this is true for quantum mechanics, for the harmonic oscillator. I mean, of course, in higher, for more complicated uh, Hamiltonians, it's no longer true. You get corrections um, of the order of h bar, but um, it's at least true for the harmonic oscillator because it's well behaved. And so, in our more general setup, we say, okay, at least we want that the harmonic oscillator also follows the Liouville equation. That's a, just ad hoc because we don't know what to write down elsewise. I don't know if this answers the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I see Miguel is writing, but uh, before he finishes, let, let me ask my question. So uh, I, w oh, no, no, uh, he, uh, I already have it. Can you get toy models for the hydrogen atom? Yeah, that was actually the, the this is the second thing after the harmonic oscillator. Uh, yes, that's that's my that's 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 sure on the list. Yes, I, so I, I, it's, we cannot because we did not do it yet, but um, that's something that we want to do. So there's, in general, there's, there is some kind of transformation in the phase space, uh, which somehow does this. So the harmonic oscillator and the hydrogen atom are not so far away. Um, but in principle, using the same formalism, you should be able to do that. It's just something we did not do yet. We just didn't have time to do it. Okay, and, and my question is, can you, uh, as, uh, have a, um, a counterpart of Tillerson bound in, for your theory. So if you introduce a new theory, you should be able to get a maximal CHSH violation, for example. Can you do this? Do you know how to do this in your theory? Okay, I, I didn't think about this, to be honest. So um, yeah, that would be, uh, that would be of course nice. This would in some sense be maybe the most obvious application, um, or well, not obvious, it would be the, the most amazing application, I would say. Um, the, the problem, so it's a long, it's a, it's a more complicated thing because you have to have composed systems. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so it should be possible. I, I don't see any reason why this formalism is not able to do it. It will just be an order of magnitude more complicated because you have composed systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So if there are no other questions, thank you, Matthias, again.